Well, welcome to our module two live session. It is 6.30 Central Standard Time, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I realize that people are still coming in, but I wanna make sure to respect everyone's time who has come um, on the start. So, so we get started, I just wanted to do a quick sound check. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Uh, can everybody see the PowerPoint too? All right, looks like we're in good shape. So, all right, now please make sure to mute your microphones at this time and unmute them at any time you want to participate in the discussion. This just helps cut down on the background noise. So, as we get started, um, uh, live session agenda kind of looks like this uh we'll have introductions we will have live classroom expectations uh discussion rubrics important reminders we'll have some check-ins from week one have the takeaways field experience reports the planning cycle um observation reporting methods and then uh we'll have and uh, do writing learning objectives and then the comprehensive lesson plan um, that you'll have for this week and then you can have questions to ask. Uh, Monica, can you please uh, unmute or mute your background? Thank you. You guys can unmute it at any time. It just cuts down on the background noise. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so as most of you know, my name is Mike Hager and I currently reside in Denver, Colorado. I have a master's degree in early childhood education and work as an administrator for Head Start. Um, if time and money was no object, I would love to travel to Brazil. My mom is from Brazil and she talks about how a beautiful country it is. I would especially love visiting the gorgeous beaches there. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Now I just want to invite you guys to share your name, where you're from, the type of program you are in, and what is your favorite place to travel to if money was no object. You guys could talk through um, audio. You guys could unmute your audio. I'll talk that way, or you guys could type in the chat box, whatever you guys feel comfortable with. Well, I'm Damien, and I am from Crete. Well, I reside in Crete, Illinois, but I'm originally from East Chicago, Indiana. I am a physical education teacher for preschool through eighth grade at a private school. And I really don't have a favorite place to travel, but if <laughs> right, I would probably go to Macau, Hong Kong. I have a, uh, my best friend lives there. Awesome. Well, welcome, Damien, and thank you for sharing uh, a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Hi, my name's Elena. I'm from um, Minnesota. I am in a preschool program right now with two and three year olds who are transitioning with potty training. And my favorite place that I'd want to go to is uh, Disney World. I'm a huge, huge Disney fan, even being 30 years old. Um, so yeah, about it. Awesome. Welcome, Elena. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome.
Welcome, Michael. Uh, you reside in Dalton, Illinois. You're trying to finish up your classes to get a degree seeking our director position. Um, you currently are employed at Chicago Public School and a daycare assistant. And if you had, I had the money, I would travel to Paris. Awesome. Thank you for sharing, Monaco. And yet, um, welcome to class. Um, do you want to share a little bit about yourself? Hi, my name is Bennett. Um, the state I'm in is in Florida. I work with toddlers. And my favorite place I would like to go to is in Canada. Ooh, where, where in Canada? Montreal. I would love to see the snow again. I missed it. Don't get that much down in Florida, do you? No, it's too hot. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome, and yet welcome everyone. Um, so I'm going to continue on. Um, we have a lot to cover, so I'm going to try to go um, through this um, quickly and thoroughly as possible. Um, so if you um, just want to do the live classroom expectations, um, I want to go over that a little bit. So this course will have uh, two live classroom sessions that I will lead to expand on the current module topics. These sessions are offered uh, in module two and module five. The next live session will be Tuesday, January 29th at 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, the purpose of the live sessions is just to engage with your peers and myself in conversation about the course concepts to further your learning. It's also good to interact, um, interactive classroom sessions to encourage open dialogue and questions um, are encouraged, usually it's you have a question somebody else probably will have the same question as you um so it's a good time for a good question and answer uh time during live sessions um and if you're watching this recording if you can't attend the live session the video will be posted the next day um in order to receive full credit you need to complete the live session quiz and answer the questions that I ask the class during the presentation um, in order to receive the full credit. So, um, Elena, Damian, Monica, and Vinette, if you guys are stay um, throughout the um, live session tonight and you know you answer and participate, you'll you'll get full credit and nothing will be asked of you. But if you end up like the, some of your other colleagues, um, they don't end up um, participating in the live session, they'll have to answer the questions in paragraph form that um, I ask you guys um, during the live session. Does anybody have any questions before I continue on? All right, hearing and seeing that there's no questions, I'm gonna keep moving on. Um, if you do have questions, please don't hesitate to interrupt and let me know. So the discussion rubric, I just wanted to take a minute to review the rubric for discussions. The purpose of the discussions is to create a conversational environment of an in-person classroom within the online community. I hope that the rubric gives you a little bit of guidance for the expectations to create strong discussion posts and to receive full credit. Um, if I feel you have not fully answered the discussion prompt in your initial discussion post, I may ask you a follow-up question that you are required to answer. Um, sometimes I just want additional information just out of curiosity so it's always good just to make sure that you read my post um and answer if i do have a question um a follow-up question um since i do not require you to answer um so if i feel like like i said if i 
feel that you have not fully answered the discussion prompt in your initial discussion poll, so I'll ask you to have a follow-up question that you're required to answer. Um, since I do require you to answer a follow-up question, I'm only requiring that you respond to only one peer uh, for initial posts. And just a big reminder is that the initial discussion posts are due by 11.59 p.m. on Tuesdays. So tonight on 11.59 p.m. Um, Central Standard Time, all initial discussion posts are due. And then your response to um, your one peer and any um, follow-up questions that I may have are due on Saturdays at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. Do you guys have any questions before I continue? All right. So I want to touch on some important reminders. Um, please make sure to look closely at the course calendar for the due dates. I don't want to deduct any points for late assignments, but the college policy is a 10% deduction for each day that an assignment is late. This does apply to the discussion post as well. Um, assignments are due by 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time every Sunday. Um, and then, and like I said earlier, initial discussion posts are due 11.59 p.m. every Tuesday. Um, and then 11.59 p.m. every Saturday discussion responses to peers that or myself are um, due at that time. Um, uh, if I ask, you're encouraged to respond to more than one peer if you would like, um, but the minimum requirement is one in order to um, get full credit. Refer to the calendar for Module 6 assignments and discussions as they are different. Um, everything in Discussion 6 uh, or in Module 6 is due by the last day of class, which is Tuesday, February 5th. Um, no late work will be accepted after this date for any reason. And does anyone have questions? All right. So, just wanted to know how you guys, how's class going so far for you guys? Um, the week new, so new information. What information did you take away from week one? Um, are you guys able to navigate through the course modules, discussion, general course questions, and so on? Weekly announcements resource tab and the last question is have you had a chance to begin your field experience observation and are there any barriers preventing you from completing this please make sure to reach out to me at any time if you guys are having barriers with um completing your field experience uh, report uh, because that is a big percentage of your grade which um i will go into in the next slide. So how's it going? So far, so good. Doesn't seem too intimidating. Uh, for myself, I would say no. Uh, this is my second field experience. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty much used to it. Um, I just feel you have to kind of like read the directions and reread them and maybe read them again to get, to get a, uh, you know, an actual understanding of what it is that us as students that we need to do. But, you know, so far, you know, everything's going pretty well. I have absolutely no problem with messaging you if i have any questions though <laughs> and that's good just feel free to message me that's sometimes how you um learn the best is just to ask questions um 
You know, you could do it through course messages. You could do it through text. If you want me to uh, respond right away, I usually will respond better with text messages as I am, uh, I am an administrator with uh, the Head Start program here in Denver, Colorado. So that does take up a lot of my time um, along as being a full-time parent. So. Um, that's a usually the best course of method to get a hold of me, but I will respond to you. It's, the college says to do it within 48 hours. I think that's way too long, um, especially in a five and a half week course. I usually try to respond to you within a couple hours, or if I see it right away, I'll respond to you right away, especially if I'm at my computer and um, I can see what you may see what you're having trouble with. Any takeaways for week one? Talk about child care licensing a little bit. Question. So in Minnesota with our licensing, I just want to know if everybody in each state has the same licensing. Um, for example, locking the teacher cabinets or putting away sanitizer bottles underneath the sink or putting <clears throat> soiled clothes underneath the sink or nap time, they have to be on their cots for 20 minutes, but then after that they have to be up. Does anybody have the same licensing regulations? I could speak for Colorado. We have a lot of the same licensing regulations, um, but sometimes it, they differ in like ratios and stuff. A lot of the safety things, like you know, the sanitizers, stuff that says keep out of the reach of children, needs to be locked up or you know out of the reach of children. Um, as far as scissors and stuff, if it's adult scissors, of course they need to be locked up the OA, but then, you know, you look at kid scissors, some kid scissors can be accessible um, in the state of Colorado as long as um, it's, you know, teacher directed, the teacher is right there with them and there's, you know, supervision of the children with that. Um, but basically with the nap time, um, you know, that a lot of them have, you know, their own licensing rules and regulations, but a lot of them are pretty similar um, with some little bit of discrepancies. Um, so yeah, um, I see that Monica is saying that nap time goes from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. Um, you know, a lot of that time that pro program programs usually have a minimum requirement of, like you said, um, 20 minutes of math. They could, you know, lay down, they need a rest period for 20 minutes if it's a full day program. And if uh, programs usually make up what the nap time is, so if it's like Monica said, it's like 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. over there, it could be different for each program. Each program usually makes up what their um, nap time schedule is, you know, depending on breaks and so forth, depend, you know, so the centers pretty much make them up themselves. Does that kind of answer your question, Elena? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, that answered it. That helped. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, sometimes it's not really, yeah, each state is a little bit different, but 
basic, basically the same, but yet just a little bit different um, with ratios. Ratio is the biggest thing that's really different. <clears throat> Does anybody have anything else to add for checking in? All right, and I'm going to move on because we do have a lot tonight. So, field experience report. So, each module's field experience report will prompt you to focus on key areas of practice. Be sure to examine it early in each module to ensure you know what to focus on for your upcoming field experiences. Then at the end of each module, you'll report on how many field experience hours you completed along with a reflection on your experience. Then overall of each module's key area of practice is in the chart, uh, in this chart. So it kind of tells you what you will be writing about. Um, and then the a reflection by its very nature, I just wanted to point this out is, very personal experience. There's really no right or wrong answer. Um, it is the habit of reflecting upon your effectiveness as an educator that is most important. And then consequently, my feedback may be brief, um, but in your written in your responses, be sure to use complete sentences as well as proper punctuation and grammar. Um, and look at the rubric um, so you know that you're going to get full points for the uh, field experience reports. Nobody has to sign anything on it. It's just um, you can just say how many hours you did for the week and that's basically what you do. You write a summary of it. Does anyone have any questions? All right, I'm going to move on. So the planning cycle. Um, I want to dig a little bit into the material and talk about it, about the planning cycle. So the first step of the planning cycle we look at is to identify the subject. Before planning a curriculum, it is really, really important that you identify for whom you're planning for. Uh, some of the things that you want to consider, um, the following reflection questions as you choose your subject. You want to know, what do I know about the child's development progress, areas of growth, home life, and interests? And what do I want the child to do or learn as a result of the lesson? It's really, really important to understand that information um, so you can set attainable outcomes for the child as you develop your lesson plan. So as we look at planning, um, now that you've identified the subject with some background information about the child's development, progress, home life, and interests, you can begin the planning piece of it. Uh, planning should include aspects such as materials needed, step-by-step uh, -step information, transition and support strategies and environmental considerations. Writing out your plan is a, usually a pretty good way to help you see it and how it will come to life. Uh, the next thing um, I would have you do is implement. Implement your plan and implementing your plan will only be effective if the child is actively engaged with your plan. So. Free choice time during play-based learning is a good way for early childhood professionals to give opportunities for the child to investigate and discover new skills and understandings. So it's really good to um, make sure that the child is actively engaged or else it's not going to work. Um, the next thing, observing. So you want to really be cognizant while each activity unfolds. So it's imperative of the rest of the cycle. We ask the question as professionals, what is working, what is not working, what learning is taking place, and how do I know? So during your observation time, you should be taking a lot of notes of your observations. There are different ways of taking observations depending on what you're looking for 
in the behavior of the child, which I will discuss um, in the next slide. Uh, the next thing you would want to do um, with the planning cycle is adjust it um, and differentiate depending on. Um, so each lesson can always expand the growth. Uh, just know, you know, as educators, we need to reflect on how we can continue to meet the individual learning and development needs of the child. How can we adapt the lesson to ensure you accommodate diverse learners? And then finally, what are the next steps we can bridge the lesson authentically into the child's home and community? As we know, the learning process doesn't end at the school, and it's our job to inform the parents and guardians of these children what we're doing so we can share this information with the parents at home to extend their learning. This does this will help the child master the outcome when there is dual support. Um, I know it's easier said than done. Sometimes parents get home and the learning ends there, which shouldn't be the case, but a lot of times I know it is. And it's kind of hard to get the parents motivated um, to help the child build that strength to scaffold their learning. The next thing um, in the planning cycle is assessing. So to complete the planning, we just must reflect on the lesson effectiveness. First, were the learning outcomes met? And how do we know? What does the child know now? And what are the next steps in the child's development and learning goals? And then the last one is repeat. You know, what could have been done differently um, to have the lesson be more effective? Maybe you can gather enough information, like the child's interests or family lifestyle. Um, just, you know, remember it's always important to gather as much information you can to meet the outcomes that are attainable for the child. Um, so now I'm going to ask you, uh, and if you're viewing this online, this is a question that I will ask um, the whole class, is you currently use the planning cycle as an ongoing process, and how do you think that will affect your teaching practices? And once again, if you're viewing this video, please answer these two questions when you submit your live section part of your assignment. What are your guys' thoughts? Do you guys currently use the planning cycles ongoing process? And if you do, how does it affect your teaching practices? For myself, I would say I do. I use it a lot. Uh, I find myself adjusting a whole lot, you know, due to, uh, you know, the diversity and learning from the different students I have in class. Um, just keeping the kids engaged, that's probably sometimes the hardest because being in physical education, if I'm dealing with a type of sport, sometimes the children, you know, if they're not good in a particular thing, they feel that they can't, you know, uh, play with the other kids or things like that. So I'm always adjusting and differentiating. But uh, so then you have to come up with a different plan. But, you know, normally, most of the time it works out. Do they ever get bored of the same thing, say, if you have, you're doing, I don't know, learning how to play tag football for two weeks. Do you ever see it getting, them getting boring and they start to act out? And like, how, how do you adjust to that? Having a hard time trying to hear you, Damien. So, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Oh, you're cutting up.
Yeah, you cut it out, Damien. I couldn't hear you. Okay, let me make sure that I'm. How about now? Yep, I hear you clear. Okay. Well, I say so far I haven't had, uh, you know, any kids to act out. Thank the Lord. Uh, most of the time it's just with the kids that feel they know more than either the other students or sometimes they feel they know more than the teacher. So I just have to kind of come to them from a different angle, you know, to uh, get my point across. So eventually it works out. Sometimes it just takes longer than I would like for it to take. You know, I just have to have patience for the most part. Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, it seems like everybody uses the planning cycle as an, um part of the ongoing process. Um, Monica says that she can see what the child is learning and not learning with observation, then she can adjust the planning as needed. Lena also says that she's continually adjusting our lessons. Um, she does one large group in the morning circle and then a break off to smaller groups and then typically like the same children together that learn in the same way. So yeah, I mean, it seems like that you guys all are doing this in a little bit of different ways, but um, that's the biggest thing is just to always observe and adjust, um, you know, to make sure that you're meeting the children way that where they are developmentally. Um, so yeah. Right, does anybody else, Bennett, do you have anything else to add? All right, I'm gonna continue. Um, I said I was going to talk a little bit about um, talk a little bit about methods of recording observations. So um, methods of recording observations, you probably do one of these at some point, or if not, maybe all of them at some point in your um, professional career um, as an early educator or as an educator. So um, I talked a little bit about the observation in the last slide. So in chapter two, there was a whole section devoted to methods of recording observation. Um, so there are several different observation methods. In choosing an observation method, you first must determine what it is that you want to learn from the observation. So I just wanted to break this down a little bit, um, how each recording method is a little bit different and what they are, um, just so you guys have some familiar familiarity of it. Um, so let's look at running records, running record forms and anecdotal forms um, are usually the most common forms of observation. So basically we'll talk about the running records forms and that's just a detailed narrative of account of behaviors or events written sequentially as an incident occurs, basically kind of like a play-by-play -play of behaviors uh, and events that is happening. Um, guessing that is something that you probably have all used at some point. Um, if not, you currently use when you do your observations. Um, there's also the anecdotal record, and that's kind of like a short story that educators use to record significant incidents that they have observed. Um, this can be written down after the behavior has taken place. Um, and then there's checklists. That's more of a formal assessment that allows educators to notate the presence and absence of some criteria with no details of the events. Basically, it's, you know, is Johnny copy today? Is Johnny have a runny nose? Basically, it's a checklist of some sort. And then you have the developmental checklists that are tools that are a list of series of criteria to indicate the presence or absence of specific behaviors representative of 
the children's development. So is the child able to do a talk with a five word sentence? Can a child balance on a beam for 10 seconds? Can different things like that. And then there's also a rating scale. Um, and that's basically the, the checklist that has been modified to include various levels of quality. Uh, in Colorado, uh, early childhood programs use Colorado Shines as a rating scale. And basically, it's just a rating scale that demonstrates the quality of the early learning program or a center. So basically, the higher the rating, the more companies, um, especially the private companies, can charge to enroll their child into a particular program because of the quality of the rating scale that um, the company has come through. Then you have the time and event sampling. So basically, they focus on problem behaviors to see how often they occur. Um, we use this quite frequently at our Head Start program. <laughs> uh, basically, the observer has a set time to observe the behavior and can check how often the behavior occurs. So that's more of um, frequency. And then the event sampling is a series of short observations to confirm the child's behavior pattern in order to provide suitable strategies to manage the child's behavior effectively. Basically, it just confirms that the behavior is happening at different times throughout the day. Now, with that being said, uh, and if you're watching this online, this is another thing that you will have to um, answer. Um, but for you guys that are here at the live session, which of the observational approaches and documentation methods do you think will be most useful to you and why? And maybe you're already doing a lot of these and know some of these. Um, what have you been doing? Why? <clears throat> so I'll share with what Monica said. She said the most helpful would to me is anecdotal because you are recording exactly what happened, what you saw or what you heard, and when it happened. Yes, it's a very significant um, incident that has occurred, which is, happens a lot in a lot of child child care programs. Especially when you have to do like incident reports and stuff, they need to be really detailed of kind of what is happening. Thanks for sharing. I will have to, I will have to agree with Monica. I use the anecdotal records. Yeah. Why do you use it? Quite often, yeah. Um, especially like every year, we have uh, in the state of Illinois, we have to do fitness observations for the students, so it's easier to use those notes because you get an idea of you know what's going on with the development right as they're doing the particular. Uh, so I say particular exercise and you can, you know, get a gist of where they need to be because I do it from week to week. So it helps me and it helps the, the children also. Well, that's, that's good to hear. I, I like that you do use that, um, you know, opposed to not saying opposed, but maybe I know a lot of um, PE teachers like to use checklists, um, but I know that those anecdotal records really do help what's going on um, with their development. And it kind of gets into the nitty gritty of how they can improve instead of just, have they met this standard or met this development or not? Elena says that her center uses developmental checklists for each class. So the infants pre-K pre program all have a different checklist. 
of the where the student should be. It's an ongoing process, but it really does help us alter our lesson plans. Um, and we also use uh, we also use the so I work for Head Start, so we have um, the, called the, the Head Start Early Learning Framework um, outcome framework, and basically it's what children should know at different ages and stages of their development. Um, and that's kind of the guide that we use in order to have lesson plans. We also do use teaching strategies gold. I'm not sure if many of you guys are aware of teaching strategies gold, but um, that is something that we do too as well. Is there anything else? Um, anything else that might be useful for you? I know the rating scale doesn't seem very useful. It's more of more follow along with the administration part. Yeah, like I said, time sampling would be great for some of my kiddos. Um, yeah, time sampling does help with the behaviors to see if it's happening at a specific time or throughout the day, which is good. Um, well, that's great to hear. Um, anything else? anything hearing or seeing nobody has any questions i'm going to move on to the uh, final part of the live session which is writing a learning objective of a smart goal um so basically in one of this week's assignments you're going to have to come up with a comprehensive lesson plan where all learning objectives must be stated as SMART goals objectives. So what are the SMART goals objectives and how do we include this in our comprehensive assignment? First of all, let's review what the characteristics of the SMART goal objectives are. So what we're looking at, we have to look at it and it needs to be specific. Goals and meet the needs of the children while upholding the program and early learning standards. You know exactly what you want to accomplish with all the details and goals must be well defined. So it needs to be really specific while meeting the needs of early learning standards and your program standards. <clears throat> the next thing is, is it measurable? Um, how will you know the goal is met? Will you use a formal assessment with the children? Um, and what will that look like? Um, how do you know if children are improving or not? How will you measure it? The next thing is, is it attainable? Um, when you're thinking about this, you want to consider developmentally appropriate practices, uh, the individual child and typical development. Um, is your goal a challenge but still possible to achieve? Um, so that's kind of things that you need to be thinking of. The next thing is, is it realistic? Um, the individual child and typical development, you know, looking at benchmarks of your or your state's early learning standards um, is a good place to go to see if those benchmarks are being met. And like I said earlier, you know, for Head Start, it's the early Head Start early learning outcome framework for children in different ages um, and is your goal realistic and within the children's reach so it's really you know getting to know your children and seeing what they could actually do or not do um, so that observation piece is really good um, 
And then timely, when will this goal be reached? Consider a timeline. Is it going to be reached uh, in one week, one month, one year? You really have to set up a timeline that is when you want to have that happen. Um, <clears throat> Monica shared, she said, when we do a lesson plan, can the SMART goals be as simple as Jane recognizes color red or more in depth? Um, so that's a good question, uh, Monica. I'm going to go into the exa an example comprehensive lesson plan just so you guys know what I'm looking for um, when um, grading. So that's uh, one of the great things about the live session. You could um, ask those questions and you could see what I'm looking for and how it should be. Um, as you guys do that, your assignment for this week. So this is my example comprehensive lesson end of my daughter. Um, I've done this uh, a few times. So um, basically, uh, whenever you're doing your comprehensive lesson plan, always make sure that here's the student's name. Don't ever put the student's name. Um, you want to put the initials. Um, just so you guys know well, for future reference. But anyways, throughout the course, you'll be creating the comprehensive lesson plan. Each week's assignment should build on your assignment from the previous week. And each week, you'll be provided a template to complete. One important thing to note that the written assignment this week is an observation of a child. So you'll base your lesson plan on the child you observe and create a lesson plan to help the child improve in one area where they need growth. Um, and then, like I said, here is the ex example I created for this week. And as you can see, I created SMART goals um, around it. So basically, this is uh, this is all of the SMART goals. So this is, is it specific? Is it measurable? Is it attainable? Is it realistic? Is it timely? Um, basically, this is what I want on a, uh, my daughter to know. Um, you want to use a verb always when you do your objectives. So use this hand-eye coordination when participating in routines, such as carrying food, eating with silverware, drinking out of a cup, pouring um, liquid into a cup, and then eating with her fingers. And basically over here, um, I want to, um, this is how I'm going to get there. So this is the activity that will help me. So providing opportunities to have Annika use forks, um, spoons, and eat eat with fingers smelling and touching different foods, pouring water into a cup, drinking water from a cup, carry food and passing food will help strengthen her motor skills and hand-eye coordination. So is it specific? Yes, it's very specific and detailed what I want her to do and how I'm going to do it. The very next thing um, when we're looking at that, so that's kind of a, just a little example in um, the next thing is identify a different food in correlation to shapes, colors, and quantity during mealtime. So I know Monica had an example up there. Jane will recognize the color red. Yes, how will we do that? Identify in this case, you know, I'm doing mealtime. Um, how will identifying different foods by their shape and colors example an apple is an an ex example an apple is a red circle. Um, so yeah, that is that. Uh, um, and then you take a look at seek information and meaning words by asking questions in words or signs such as what's that, who's that, why, or what happened at meal time. And then basically is the implementation of using visuals, um, providing those modalities and materials for um, Annika um, on having a daily schedule board of the eating at the table and reading specific books in regarding to mealtime and asking questions to scaffold the child's learning. 
And basically, you know, they're enriched areas over here. Um, and how I'm going to get there and what my SMART goals are, are right over here. And they kind of go hand in hand if you take a look at it. Um, engages in positive interactions such as, thank you, please, excuse me. Um, no, thank you, you're welcome. And a wide variety of situations with familiar adults. So basically, how are we going to get there? How are we going to promote learning and growth in the domain? Well, I'm going to ask Annika, we'll use positive manners such as please, and thank you. And this will be modeled by the adult, so Monica will know what is appropriate and positive ways of communicating. So basically, you want to make sure that when they're you're doing the activity that you're also keeping track is the child actually doing that. You really want to monitor if they're actually doing that by using your whatever recorded method that you use, if it's anecdotal records or whatnot. Um, so that's a good way how to do it. And then over here demonstrates awareness of own thoughts, feelings, preference. After trying new foods, Annika will have awareness and feelings about the new foods that she tried. She will show emotion by trying new foods. So she'll either be happy, sad, um, et cetera. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, does anybody have questions? Oh, it looks like there is some questions coming in. Um, <clears throat> for the lesson, is there a template? Yes, there is a template. You will have to download it and then you will fill it out. Um, I downloaded this the template off of the um, assignment page and then I just filled this stuff out. Uh, if you have questions about Trying to fill it out, let me know. Um, one thing I do want to mention to everybody is make sure that when you guys are doing your assignments to make sure to use the browser Firefox. Uh, sometimes you don't get to see everything if you're in Internet Explorer um, or even uh, Chrome. Um, so make sure that you download Firefox uh, because that will make that as the version that the college uses that it'll make sure that you see everything um, on line um, for the class so you're not missing out on anything. Anybody have any questions? And yet, have you used uh, Firefox to download? Um, have you used Firefox for your browser? Because sometimes, if you don't use Firefox, stuff like um, the download to download different um, things will not show up. So if you haven't tried that, try that first. Does anybody have any other questions? Um, I do. Uh, my question is, because I'm teaching pre-K through eighth grade, is there a specific age group you would like the lesson plan to be created around? As long as it's, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it doesn't matter. As long as they're not um, older than eight years of age. Okay. <clears throat> Is there any other questions about the example? Um, lesson plan.
And, you know, as um, you think of questions as they come up, please feel free to um, email me, text me. Like I said, text message usually works a lot faster for me. Um, and make sure that um, you, uh, I'll get back to you right away usually with text messages um, if your questions do come up. Uh, does anybody else have anything else to share? All right, well, if I'm hearing and seeing that nobody has any other questions, um, like I said, if they do come up, feel free to email me or um, send me out a text, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Um, so you can all, all you guys can have a good night, and I will talk with you guys all soon. All right. Have a good night. Is there a poll tonight, class? Nope, I do everything a little, little bit different. Um, you don't have a code for this class. What you do is you show up, you participate. I write your name down because I can see everybody who has participated, and oh. that's how you get credit. All right, thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night. All right, thank you. Yep. Have a good night. All right. Good night.